Hello folks, good to see you today. Not sure why, but I got booted just a second ago. Poor internet connection, we'll see what happens. Welcome to Memorial Day weekend. It's a big weekend. May's a busy month, have you ever noticed that? Seems like, didn't we do Mom's Day? And now we got Memorial Day. All these graduations that are happening. And uh, let's see, there's another one. Oh, my son, my oldest son's birth month. He was born in May, so it's kind of a busy month around here. But anyhow, glad to have you with me. Boy, I hope we're not going to lose this, but I got a streaming problem. I don't know, it's a gorgeous day outside, but uh, anyhow, here we go. Lord's Day Live, thank you for being with me. As you can see, got a lot of stuff on the map we need to cover. Uh, with regards to our Bible class, and then here in just a little bit, we'll do our sermon time, and we're going to talk about Memorial Day. We're going to look at a unique twist on Memorial Day. We're going to talk about Joseph, so stick around for that, okay? Um, see, like there's something else I needed to say. I don't know what it is. Hi, Judy. Good to see you. Judy's in with us this morning, so maybe I am getting out. I'm glad to, I'm glad to see that. All right, let's get after this then. Our Bible class time, we are dealing with graduations, that kind of thing. And we're talking about making decisions. Remember that? And uh, we're trying to lay all these things out with regards to making decisions. So let's just do it one last time because this is actually my last lesson on this particular topic. Remember, you got your D for in date, which is for deny. A is for advice. T is for turning signal. And E is for expedient. Remember all that? So we got deny, uh, advice. Turning sig now and expedient. Expedient. That's a P. Expedient. And you remember we tried to draw those things. Hi, my mom's in. I don't know how mom's doing that. She's traveling right now. She's just getting back from a graduation up there in Berea, Kentucky, where my nephew graduated. Cool guy, one of the hardest working guys I know. But anyhow, good to have you with us, mom. She's pedaling home, I think. All right, so you got deny, and remember, deny, we did that alter thing. I don't know if I can do it real fast for you. We're going to try real quick. We don't have a lot of time this morning to deal with past reviews and that kind of thing. Remember we did the alter thing? That was Romans 12, 1 and 2, and I'm not real good with fire. We established that earlier, but uh, <laughs> that's pitiful, isn't it? Uh, anyhow, that's supposed to look like a flame. But anyhow, there you go. You got deny. We're supposed to deny ourselves. And then you got advice. That one was pretty easy. I could do that one. Remember, we got the we got the word bubble, uh, and I think I put in there what about dot dot dot. You know, consider you know advice. You need to have advice from a lot of folks. And then we did the turning signal. Oh my! Let's see here. We got oh, oh that I don't need to do that. But anyhow, I've already done it. There you go. That's supposed to be the tires. And here's Sunny Child sitting right here. See, that's me. My big hit. That's me. These are the tires. Here's the tires. Got it? And that's supposed to be the back end of a vehicle, remember? And you got these turning signals, and da, 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 da. what does that mean? If that one's going off, that means you're about to turn right, right? And so the turning signals, when you deny yourself, seek the advice of other godly people, look for God's turning signals. We talked about that last week. Remember how that Paul wanted to go over? He wanted to actually get to Ephesus, I believe. And so he came up this way, he went that way. God said no, so he turns this way. Remember that? God said no, and then he comes over here. Actually, comes right down to here. And uh, that's Troas. Remember, and he has the, uh, the, the the dream, and it's the uh, dream that leads him over here to Macedonia, to Philippi. Remember, well, I can't do last week. Remember all that? Okay. And then we got expedient. And expedient means to do the greatest amount of good in the shortest amount of time. That's a Sonny Child's version of the definition. That's actually, I picked it up from my dad. He's a pretty smart dude. He's preaching right now in the Marmaduke Church of Christ. But anyhow, that's other, we could talk about him at another time. Expedient, expedient. And I got to thinking, how in the world am I going to illustrate expedient? So here's what you got to do. I need you to draw a very wavy arrow. Let me see if I can do it for you, okay? Here we go. All right, a very wavy arrow. It's not too bad. A very wavy arrow, okay? Expedient is not taking that route. Now I want you to draw another arrow inside the arrow, and I want you to go like that. See how I did that? Isn't that cool? Expedient is taking the straight route. Expedient is going and doing the greatest amount of good in the shortest amount of time. That's expedient. 
That's what we're dealing with this morning, expedient. All right, in order to cover the subject matter well, you need to let the Bible speak, right? Just talking to a guy just, uh, just yesterday or the day before, and he was all over me about Calvinism and whatever it may be. And he was suggesting, we've got to allow human influence in the interpretation process or we can't know. Now, why don't you just let the Bible tell us what the Bible says? Remember that series we started on way back? And by the way, if you, if you didn't get it, you can go to my, my uh, YouTube page and you can get that. And we listened to, what was there, six or seven lessons on how the Bible itself validates the Bible itself, <clears throat> let the Bible <clears throat> interpret the Bible. When God interprets himself, at the end of the day, what do you got? God. That's what we want, right? If you put man into the process, <clears throat> I guarantee you, it's going to get things all twisted, etc., etc., etc. I got something in my throat. Can you tell? You notice I'm not in a, in a, in a dress shirt this morning. I do have my dress britches on. Can you see that? Because uh, I don't have to preach this morning. This morning, when I pedal out of here, I'm going to my home congregation. One of the other men is preaching this morning. I get a, a week off. I didn't. Uh, I don't generally get one of those. I get a weekend off, and it's probably a good thing because I just finished up a meeting, a gospel meeting in Monette. Did a, they had a wonderful congregation. It was a really neat congregation. But I spoke five times, and then I got sick on Friday. and didn't even get to do my Friday live thing. Remember that? But anyhow, so it's probably a good <clears throat> that I got a moment off. <laughs> Sorry about all the hacking. Let's get back to the subject matter. Making decisions then, making decisions. As you come down the list and you get to expedient, I'm drawn to John chapter 9 and verse 4. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. There are three things about expedient. When you're making a decision, going the, 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 the straight route, greatest amount of good, shortest amount of time. There are three things revealed in this short passage about expediency that I think are very, very important. Number one, you've got to content, you've got to consider the potential time and opportunities that you're presently given. Present given, presently given, presently given. I think that's a good way, good way of saying it. That you're presently given. You got to, you got to, you got to understand those. By the way, I didn't do this, but I should have. Pause for a second. Remember, we're always taking it to the map, and we're trying to apply it to the map. John is going to write somewhere in this area here about the 90s. So I'm going to put a little arrow right there. Can you even see that? They're saying that the book of John that we're reading, our passage about, they're saying that the book of John was probably 90 to 100 as far as the first century is concerned. And so John's a very old man at this particular point, and uh, you got John's writings are towards the end of the first century. If you were going to put John on the geographical map, you have to come over here. Remember, we've got the boot blob, banana boat with bubbles being bounced beside a balloon, all that kind of stuff. Well, um, you've got the balloons over here. That's the Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, Dead Sea. Can you see that? Yeah, that's not too bad. Remember, the most famous city in all of history is Jerusalem, right? Not Mecca. Jerusalem. And that Jerusalem sits right about there. Can you see that? Yeah, that's not too bad. Well, I'm told that John, the one who writes the passage that we're looking at, I'm told that John comes from Bethsaida. And let me do something else for you so you can... The, the Jordan River doesn't actually begin at the Sea of Galilee. Okay, and so if you were to take the Jordan River even on north beyond that, you would find that there's two famous cities at the top of the Sea of Galilee. On the eastern side of the Jordan River right here is the city of Bethsaida. I'll put a B there so you can remember. That's where John's from. On the other side is Capernaum. Okay, And there's a lot of stuff to be said about Capernaum. We're not going to do that. I just wanted to give you kind of a reference point for future lessons, etc. So you can identify that. But John is from Bethsaida according to my studies. Okay, And so you've got John writing about 90 A.D. He's from Bethsaida, is where his hometown is. Uh, a lot of what he is, uh, they, they say that John probably died in Ephesus, and probably saw a lot of the writings that he did were from there, etc., but I'm not going to deal with that right now either. Okay, I just wanted to give you the historical background. Now I've got too many pens. Okay, now let's get back to where we're at before we run out of time. There's my buddy Austin. <clears throat> Austin's from Texas. I mean, a name like Austin, where would you be from? Austin, good to see you. Uh, he says, love you and your hard work. I love you and your hard work. Really cool guy. All right, got to move on. Expedient. All right. First thing, remember, when you're trying to 
factor in the expediency part of your decision-making process. You need to look at the potential time and opportunities that are presently being had. And so you obviously can't judge fully what's coming tomorrow. And so you've got, to, you've got to factor in what you presently got. And so as you're trying to make this tough decision, you need to say, at present, with what i got and what I understand about the circumstances, what is going to allow me to do the greatest amount of good in the shortest amount of time? That's expedient. Okay? So first of all, you've got to measure the potential time and the opportunities that are at hand. All right? But number two, you'll see how this is playing out. Number two, notice that he doesn't just say, Jesus that is, that as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. That's the potential time and opportunities that we have present tense. He goes on to say, night is coming. So he also gives us now parameters that you and I, although we can't predict the future, we can know certain things that are happening, that are going to happen. Specifically, night is coming. Notice that he says here, night is coming when no man can work. Limited time and opportunities is the second part of expediency that you have to factor in. Not just that there is presently potential time and potential opportunities, but you also have to factor in that those present potential moments and opportunities are limited. They're, they're not going to be here forever. And so that, of course, leads us to, again, back to expedient. So whatever decision you make as you try to run it through the, the biblical ciphering system, as you as it were, whatever decision you, you make, remember that you've got to make it in view of the fact that my time and opportunities aren't going to last forever. And whatever you presently have, know how history plays out, whatever you presently have, it's not likely to last. In fact, those of us who are older, got a lot of gray hair, can you see my gray hair? You know that it seems like time actually just, it, it speeds up. And so, as you get older, you begin to recognize that just, there's a, there's a lot of limited nature to the time and opportunities that we have. So you got to factor that one with regards to expediency. Number three, there's only three of them. And then number three, no one can work. Oops, I got my expedient arrow in the middle of three, but that's okay. You can still see it, right? The third part here is we got to recognize that there is an end of time and there is an end of opportunities. Now, that's very similar to number two, no man can work, except that this is not only part of the urgency, but the tragedy about what is to come if I don't take full advantage of my potential time and opportunities. There will be an end of time. There will be an end of opportunities. And so that should cause me, number one, to feel very urgent about doing the greatest amount of good in the shortest amount of time. But number two, it ought to, it ought to make me very passionate about the decisions that I make, that I make them in the right manner, because eventually this whole thing's going to stop, and I won't have any more opportunities, I won't have any more time, and at that particular point, my influence is frozen. There's no more that I give. And for those, when time ends and opportunity ends, for those folks, when their time and opportunities are up, their eternity is frozen. There's no more opportunities for them to, to make adjustments to the schedule, to make adjustments to their priority list, that kind of a thing. So, since it's our last day with regards to this particular subject matter, and remember why we're doing it, because a lot of graduates this time of month, and I just wanted to make sure that if you're a graduate, you can put your decision-making processes through this. So real quickly, a review. If, you're ha if you've got a difficult subject uh, decision to make, what class am I going to take this fall that's going to help me best with my major? Uh, what career choice am I going to make that's going to uh, be the best decision that God would have for me in life? Uh, maybe you've got somebody I'm sweet on. Are they the individual that I, I want to actually invest my entire life in? As you're making some of these big decisions, graduates and others, filter them through this divine system. I'm the one who put the word date together and all that kind of thing. But it came straight out of the Bible. We've seen every, every one of these words comes from a biblical thing. We picked out a biblical passage that deals with it. And I'm sure you could add more letters to the date, but this is what I came up with in my personal study. I've used it over the years many times with both of my boys, with my wife, making difficult decisions. First thing you got to do is you got to deny yourself. You have to be an individual who is going to live up to the 
promise that you made to Jesus that I will be an, a I will be a living sacrifice, an ongoing sacrifice of me. Remember the prayer we talked about earlier on several weeks ago. Lord, help me to want what you want me to want. You got to be able to say that. And if you'll pray that over and over again, He will help you to deny your own selfishness so that He can come first. Number two, all right, you got this decision that's got to be making that you're you're trying to make. Seek advice, but remember, seek advice from individuals who have already proven themselves to be centered in God's will, proven themselves to have a good track record with regards to whatever is taking place, or if they have a bad track record, are willing to acknowledge that before you and say, "Look, I messed up here. Don't go that path." Seek advice from folks who really have credibility. Remember the story I told you about talking to the woman. She was on the verge of getting divorced from her husband. I think they actually went ahead and got divorced. And it just really bugged me because we'd have a Bible study once a week and it seemed like things were going good. And then she'd go off and she'd talk to her friend who had been married. I think she'd been married three times and divorced. And I think she was presently living with another guy. I know she had a history of that kind of... And she was letting all that advice from somebody who clearly has proven they didn't even know how to have a good working relationship, she allowed that advice to undermine the biblical scriptures. Seek advice from folks who have credibility. Number two, the turning signal that we got here, remember that God is going to give you indicators. Now the indicators not might not be as dramatic as what Paul got. You may not get a vision in the night, you may not have an angel tap you on the shoulder, all that kind of stuff, but you certainly have things in your life that are taking place that you say to yourself, wow, that had to be God, because I didn't. I don't have the brains to arrange it that way, and I didn't. I didn't manipulate circumstance. That has to be God. So look for God's turning signals as you make this decision, and then today, expedient. Remember, whatever decision that you make, we've got limited time and limited opportunities, and it's quickly coming to an end. And so, whatever you decide to do, do what is going to bring about the greatest amount of good in the shortest amount of time. And by the way, investing in this physical realm ain't it. The greatest amount of good. In the shortest amount of time, has excuse me has to do with looking towards eternity and doing for your friends, your neighbors, and yourself that which is best for God and your eternal future. So there you go. All right, let me erase this because then I got to show you. Then we got to do the questions. You got to do the. You know, teachers, get your cell phones out and ready to take a picture and get this cleaned off. I'm going to have to replace my plastic covering on this. I think because it is really getting messy. All right, that's not too bad. All right, here you go. You ready? See how that worked? Come on. I'm going to have to walk over here. I think my batteries went dead. There it is, Q, and I see that. Booyah! All right, there you go. Here are the questions that you teachers need to get a picture of so that you can discuss them with your class. Uh, what does the E stand for and the date that we I just told you? It's got an X, E-X. I'll give you that much of a hint. Uh, what's the meaning of this word that has an E-X at the front end? Uh, what phrase from John 9, 4? Read that again. Potentially, you've got those four, those next three. You can do those. Where would you place the book of John on the timeline? Oh, oh, I gave you a hint there. Oh, 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 oh. I've got to take this. You guys aren't looking, are you? And where would you put them on the biblical map? <laughs> <laughs> all right, you got all that? Good deal. Good deal. All right, Memorial Day. We're about to have a, a sermon time with regards to Memorial Day. But before we do that, let's do the prayer time. That's what comes next, isn't it? Boy, I'll tell you what. Hey, you did it. Prayers. Our president, I, he, he's been under it since he was elected. And uh, he continues to be under it. The man has got a foul mouth, a pitiful background, on and on I can go with that. But I guarantee you, folks, he is no less capable of being used by God than Nebuchadnezzar was when he took care of God's people in the past. And by the way, I had this same prayer for President Barack Hussein Obama, even though I was convinced that he had Muslim roots and probably himself is a closet Muslim. We've got to pray for our president. I did for Barack Hussein Obama, and I am for Donald Trump. We've got to pray for our president that there will be calmer minds, including his own, that will reign in the governmental sex setting. Folks, we've got an election that's upcoming that I just think that some of us who have our, our heads buried in the sand just do not realize the, the importance of what's coming. If there's nothing other than those who are being 
appointed to the bench with regards to being becoming a judge. That alone is significant enough to make sure that you vote for conservative minds, conservative voices. I am convinced that on the horizon there is persecution for the church, and it's going to come, I think, harshly for you and I, if we do not have somebody who's defending us in the legal system, and uh, we've got to have a president who is willing to appoint conservative judges. Pray for our president. My friend Doug, I spoke to Doug, uh, Doug's wife, Joyce, uh, this past week. I'm not sure what day it was, but uh, on Facebook we were, we were typing out, and I, I even called him this past week and talked with her for a little while. Um, he continues to struggle with cancer, etc. He has his good days, bad days, and even with, throughout the days, those of you who struggle with cancer, you know how this is. Good moments in the day and bad moments in the day. Be uh, prayerful for Doug and his sweet wife who is caring for him. Uh, equally to that, my good friend Carl and his sweet wife, uh, I pray that you will pray for them, that uh, as they struggle through the various issues that he has, a lot of it having, having to do with breathing and his heart not working fully, Carl, that is. Um, big, big map summer. We're, we're a week away. To, a week from today, the map kids will start coming in here. And uh, I believe that it's one of the most important works that I have ever been associated with because we're not just taking them to occasional Bible classes throughout the week. No, when they come, they have intense biblical training about various things having to do with seeing America as a mission field. First week of June is going to be team building. And the, the masters come together and learn how to function as a team. The second week is homemade roles. This is directed by my wife and my oldest son. Talks about how that the home is the most important mission field we have, the most fertile mission. You've got to take care of your home first before you're able to go out and work in other areas. The third week is the voice. And this one, uh, Jenna, it comes down from Kentucky, and she's a professional, and she teaches us how to use our voices and to sing well and all those kind of things. And then the fourth week of June is Life Missions. Kathy, uh, she will direct that week, and it's always one of the most popular weeks as we go out and do service projects, etc., etc. First week of July is Adult Studies Week. If you're an adult listening to this and want to come, we <coughs> forgive me. We got camper space, we got cabin space, on and on you go with that. We've been doing all kind of renovations to make sure that we're ready for that. That is July Fourth weekend or, or week. And so if you want to take your July 4th vacation and come and spend the time with us studying the Bible, it's pretty intense. We uh, A lot of adults show up, and we're in the book all day long. And uh, come and be a part of that. That's the first week of July. Then the last three weeks of July, we have a specific team that is selected from our mature masters, and they actually will travel and go to Bayou Jack, Louisiana, where I will be helping to, they, and they will be helping to conduct a VBS. Then uh, we will go from there... No, first, uh, the third, uh, the second week we have training and for that, and then we go do VBS, and then we have a spiritual road trip. And uh, anyhow, that is a busy, busy month, and I need you to pray for us that we will be able to maintain our sanity during all of that. Clara, no update on this for, for her from for a long time, but uh, colon cancer, good friends in Indiana, have her on my heart and list. Uh, that's their daughter. Uh, Todd, again, I don't, I haven't had an update on this, and so uh, Melanie or any of the rest of you down there, if you can let me know how Todd's doing, any updates on the tests that uh, were run, etc. I, I would like that so our people can be praying effectively for you. And then again, Tina and Linda, both uh, breast cancer survivors. Uh, I see Tina almost weekly at church. Uh, I know that she started some difficult treatments here this week, and, and I saw a picture of her in the, in the hospital bed. Keep her in your, in your purse. Uh, I believe Linda had her surgery, but I haven't had an update there in, in a while. So please keep uh, those things, the updates that is coming my way. And if you have a prayer request, all you got to do is go ahead and send me a message right now. That help, it helps when you keep the message right in connection with the, the video. And uh, that way I can get it up. We also have Monday Morning Live, as most of you know, tomorrow. And uh, that's when I, it's more of a funny time, but I also have a prayer request time during that. And so a lot of folks around the country, around the world, could be praying for your request if you will bring it to our attention. Okay, what do we lack? I think that's it. So I'm going to leave that up there for a moment. I'm going to go over here and blow my nose because I just got this whole thing happening. And then in just a few moments, we will be coming back for the sermon time 
interesting look at Joseph and Memorial Day. So be praying about these folks, please, in the next few moments. Good morning, folks. Welcome to the sermon segment of Lord's Day Live. Thank you for joining in. It's Memorial Day weekend, and I uh, did a little research on Memorial Day, and uh, this is the time of year that many of us would go to the gravesides, and we'd honor those who have passed away. It's also very important for us to remember, and I think it originated with the idea of remembering the fallen uh, soldiers that have given their lives to you and I could uh, have the freedoms that we have. And so while we're uh, grilling our hamburgers and uh, playing Nerf Gun Wars and all that kind of thing out in the backyard today, let's not forget that some folks 
gave their life early, many of them 18, 19, 20 years old, never experienced the life that you and I have experienced, but they did that so that you and I would have what we have. I wrote a, a poem years ago, and uh, we have uh, the memorial wall that is coming to our community this coming weekend, I believe, and we're hoping to take Gabriel over there, hoping that he will be impressed with the number of uh, folks who died so that he would have his freedom. Um, this poem alludes to that wall and other things. Upon the wall, their names are etched within museums, pictures sketched. Bookstore, excuse, books are written of heroes lost and songs composed of that great cost. Proud statues stand which bear their names and flag-marked graves our loss proclaims. Memorial Day, our pause is brief. Do we appreciate their grief? A generation comes and goes which fought no wars and faced no foes. Our memory slips, our heart grows cold. We soon forget the soldiers bold. We all should feel it personally. They died for us. They died for me. This morning as we reflect on reflecting, as we try to remember, to remember, I want to take you to an interesting story about Joseph. In fact, let me just throw that picture up here real quick so that you can see where we're going. Well, time of this particular lesson, Forgotten. Joseph and Memorial Day, Forgotten. I was studying his life again recently, and I was, I was noticing three things specifically about Joseph and the tragedy of, of some of the things that took place in his life. He was certainly a forgotten person at least three times, very prominent times in his life or in his, uh, his story. We find, we find him to be a forgotten individual. I chose this picture offline because it, to me it just really grabs the tragedy of the life of Joseph. It also, I think, emphasizes the divine intervention of God on behalf of those who are faithful to to his to his values and, and to his calling. Joseph certainly was one of those individuals. You see him here as a young man being pulled away uh, by the slave traders. Um, his family over there on the right, and their, their individuals were they're handing out the money to get rid of Joseph. Remember, there's a great jealousy thing happening there. And because of jealousy, their jealousy and their bitterness, it, it led them to rash choices. And this is one of those rash choices that takes place. Now, there is not any indication in Scripture that you and I should credit these guys with doing a good thing in the sense that this was something God really was excited about. I'm so thankful that Joseph was going to have to go be a prisoner. At the same time, God can take bad stuff and turn it into good, remember? And he's going to do that with Joseph. In fact, Joseph was actually going to say that to his brothers later on, that uh, that which they did in this situation actually turned out for the good of the family. It's not really part of my lesson, but I wanted to see three concepts from the life of Joseph and his forgottenness, if you will. Now, before we go there, let's go to our map just real quickly, because I'd like to identify for you where Joseph falls out. On the timeline, Joseph, of course, is going to be right about here, because he is going to be just prior to Moses, right? Moses is going to give us the Ten Commandments, and so you're going to have Joseph as he is going to be here, and then... We're going to find, well, you know that story. I'll tell you about it briefly here in just a moment. And then, remember, Joseph is going to be sold down to here in Egypt. So Egypt is down here. So if you want to give it a geographical point, here's this, and here it is on the, on the, the, the timeline. All right, now back to our story. Remember how it plays out. Brothers are jealous. They sell him. And they tell the father, tell uh, his dad, that, that he's been you know mauled by a, a wild beast, and they present the coat to the dad that's covered in blood. It's a whole setup kind of a scenario. You remember that story. Okay. He goes down to Egypt. There in Egypt, you might recall, imagine this young man. as he, He's trying to figure things out, and, and, and now he's become a slave. He was actually very pampered in his own home, and now he's become a slave, and he's having to use muscles that he never had to use before, and, and he's being abused and hurt, and all, the, all that stuff is happening. The hopelessness that swirls around him. Anyhow, he's sold... To Potiphar, and you remember that story. And Potiphar is going to really like this guy because he's a hard worker. He didn't allow his circumstances to dictate his 
his uh, response to life or his character, etc. Big application for the young people of today who live a such pampered lives and then they can't even stand up when the national anthem is sung. I mean, really? Anyhow, Joseph, as he is sold into, into slavery, he goes down there, Potiphar buys him. He, eventually, Joseph is going to be made head over the house. You remember that? And then you got that whole thing with Potiphar's wife. She's, she's a, not a nice woman, and she tries to seduce him, and she lies about him, etc., and so he gets thrown into jail. All right, it's there in jail that we have our first illustration of forgottenness. And I'm not even sure that's a word, but we're using it this morning. Forgottenness. Oops, let's come back to it. Forgottenness. First thing I want you to understand is that on Memorial Day, that is, as we make application, that we are people who are prone to forgetting. Prone to a lifestyle that is so busy that we just move on. Oftentimes it's, it's intentionally, as we're going to see in the next point. But sometimes it happens just because the memory is neglected. It's not taken care of. You and I need to make massive applications to this with regards to our Memorial Day uh, weekend. Are you taking care of the memory? Is this just about you know cooking hot dogs and hamburgers on the grill out back and throwing the frisbee and having the family over or is this a time when we literally stop and we think somebody died so that I can sit on my back porch we need to be people who do not neglect the memory come to our passage Genesis 40 20 23 now the third day was Pharaoh's birthday and he gave a feast for all of his officials he lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker in the presence of his officials he restored the chief cupbearer to his position so that he once again put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he impaled the chief baker, just as Joseph had said to them in his interpretation. You remember that story? We'll deal with it here in a second. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. Remember they had dreams. Joseph interprets a dream. He says to the cupbearer that you're going to survive. He says to the baker, basically, he says you're not going to survive. That comes about. You would think that in that scenario, that the cupbearer, he would have remembered Joseph. You'd have thought that after having somebody who has devoted uh, his friendship and, and given time and given him such good news, you would have thought he would have remembered him. But that last verse is powerful because it says the chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. Now we know later on he's going to remember him, but he forgot him right now. Something later had to jog his memory. Do we have to have a special date in May to jog our memory to remember? It's kind of like Thanksgiving. Is Thanksgiving really about you and I getting together and gorging ourselves, or is Thanksgiving about giving thanks? You know, see, some of our holidays have become moments that are supposed to remind us, but instead of reminding us, it allows us to drift off into selfishness again. That's what takes place here with this friend. Remember the, cir the circumstances and the setting. You know, Joseph has got to be distraught about the fact that he's been thrown into jail, unjustly, by the way. And now the cupbearer has been thrown into jail, unjustly, evidently. And you'd have thought that they would have bonded so powerfully that the cupbearer would have remembered him. But he doesn't, because he got so busy taking care of his own stuff that he neglected the memory. Application number one, folks, this Memorial Day week weekend, don't neglect the memory. Somebody died so that you could enjoy the day. Individuals have gone before you, family members, etc., some of whom never fought a war. I get all of that. But there's folks in the graveyard right now who have done, in the past, marvelous things to promote an opportunity for you to have conveniences. Don't be part of this selfish entitlement generation that can't look beyond their own nose. When the national anthem is sung, stand up. Put your hand across your heart. Be thankful for the thousands of men and women who died so that you can have the moment to actually hear it being sung. We need to make sure we do not neglect the memory. Number two. Not only do we have friends, but let's remember the family. Now, I'm pedaling forward. I'm trying to keep these passages kind of in chronological order. We've talked about this tragic scene. That's all in the past now. Joseph has gone on down to Egypt. Joseph has done well for himself in spite of his, the cruelty put towards him with regards to his brothers, etc. And he rises to the top of uh, governing the house of Potiphar, but then again eventually gets back into jail. The roller coaster ride is amazing. Joseph, what a crazy, cool faith this guy had. 
And then he's going to, remember, he's going to interpret the dream. He's going to be forgotten. But then eventually the cupbearer will, oh, I remember the guy. Yeah, he can interpret dreams, Pharaoh. And Pharaoh says, get that dude. And so they bring Joseph in. That's where we pick up with this second part. And uh, Joseph is going to interpret the dream. Pharaoh will make him second in command over Egypt. They survive the great famine. Eventually his brothers, Joseph that is, his brothers have to come down to get food. Pick up with the passage. Genesis 42. Their father, Jacob, said to them, You have deprived me of my children. Joseph is no more. Skipping on down. And now you want to take Benjamin. Everything's against me. Then Reuben said to his father, Entrust him to my care, and I will bring him back. But Jacob said, My son will not go down there with you. His brother is dead, and he is the only one left. If harm comes to him on the journey, this is important, if harm comes to him on the journey you are taking, you will bring my gray head down to the grave in sorrow. Joseph and Benjamin were the favorite sons of Jacob. And as this begins to play out, I want you to notice that there is a memory that is being rejected in all of this. Who knows over the years how many times Jacob must have wept, gotten off by himself, and, and it, it got discouraged, depressed, etc. And the brothers of Joseph, they knew why dad was depressed. They knew that it was the story that they had told him that your son, your favorite son, is dead. They also knew it was a lie. But all these years they're living out this lie. Ever done that? If we have hurt someone, we need to be, if it's our fault. We, we need to go and we need to take care of that. Have you gossiped about someone? Spread slanderous rumors about someone without ever even going to them and talking about the facts? You need to take care of that because it puts you in a world of hurt with regards to your relationship with God. Well, here are some guys who are living with a lie, the brothers. And I, I wanted to point out verse 38 because notice what Jacob says, my son will not go down there. Now, he does eventually, you know that. Will not go down there because look at what you've done. You've taken jo uh, Joseph from me and now you want to take Benjamin from me. You don't think that at that moment the hearts of the brothers had to just kind of, oh, hurt again, or maybe they're so stone cold at this point they're not hurting at all because of a seared conscience. I don't know. But whatever it is, the memory is being rejected. This was one of probably many opportunities that those boys had to, to fess up and to say, Dad, Joseph's not really dead, and I can't tell you what happened to him. But this, they could have done that. But all these years they're living with that because they're rejecting the memory. Memory rejected. Do you have somebody in your life who, who served you well. They worked hard to, to bring you to where you are. But maybe there was a falling out at some point. I don't know. Whatever. But for whatever reason, you turned your back and you went away. And you have, over the years, been constantly rejecting that memory. Because to bring that memory up is to bring guilt up and to bring conviction up. And then, obviously, if I'm going to respond correctly, it's to bring change up in my life. And I'm not interested in changing. And so you've been, over the years, rejecting that memory, you need to get rid. You need to get right. You need to get rid of that. It will eat you up from within. So the second thing, you've got friends. Number one, number two, you've got family, and the memory is actually rejected. First of all, memory neglected, memory rejected, and then number three, memory infected. I've already been a little politically incorrect this morning, but I'm going to probably pounce upon it with just a little more fervor at this particular point because it really does bother me the number of spoiled brats that we have within our country who refuse to remove their ball cap, put their hand over their, their heart, or stand when the national anthem is being sung, the uh, Pledge of Allegiance is being stated, whatever it may be. It really, really bothers me. Because many in this generation never even went to war. Never even had the threat of war really over, hanging over top of them like they're going to be drafted or whatever it may be. But because of their selfishness and, by the way, poor parenting that didn't lead them to a thanksgiving, because of all of that, we find them acting very, very selfish towards those who died, paid the ultimate price so that they could live. We have a country that in many respects has been infected by the selfishness of entitlements. The socialists 
who are wanting to corrupt the Constitution and to turn us toward a Venezuela kind of a, of a government, these are individuals who don't understand or appreciate what they need to appreciate about those men and women who have died to give us the freedoms that we have. The last point is country. We've had friends, family, and now country with regards to memory. And it's memory infected. Joseph has died. He's, he's, he's been gone a while now. Uh, in fact, the last chapter of Genesis is about the death of Joseph. But he's been gone, and now we're going to turn the page, and we're going to move from here, from Joseph, into a dis description of Moses. So, remember, Joseph brings his family down there, and, and they're going to they're going to thrive, and uh, they're going to really, really do well. And there's going to be some people, as some scholars estimate that there could have been as many as two and a half million of them that actually left Egypt when they went off towards the Promised Land. All that has transpired in the interim. He's died, and this is what takes place. Joseph, that is, has died. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph, big phrase. And he said to his people, Look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them. They were concerned that the children of Israel were going to rise up, take over the country, da 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 The problem with this picture is that this new king, who did not know Joseph, why? Because the memory was neglected. Probably in many situations, especially here, it's rejected. And now it has become infected to the point that the very people who come from the family of Joseph have become the problem within the nation. May I make a massive parallel with regards to Christianity? This nation was not founded on Buddhism. This nation was not founded on Shintoism. This nation was not founded on, on Islamism. Islamic teachings. It was founded upon Christianity. It's undeniable. Read the letters, the many writings of our, of our founding forefathers, and yet all of a sudden, now Christianity has become the enemy. All of a sudden, we have turned our back on the very values that brought us to where we are. Why aren't these folks remembering Joseph? Why aren't they remembering the Great Famine? Why aren't they remembering the fact that their, their nation survived because of the wisdom of this man? Obviously imparted to him by God. Why, are the, why have they forgotten all of these things? It's not just because the memory was neglected and rejected, but now it has become infected where the very ones who are the children of the hero have become the enemy. And we are there in America today. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. It's Memorial Day. And when we find individuals who reign over us in Washington, D.C., or in other influential scenarios, who have intentionally forgotten our past because they have some progressive concept that somehow we could improve upon this if we would just go to something that is radically different from this. And they divorce themselves from the very things that brought us here. When that happens, we come right up against the words of Jeremiah, who reminds us to return to the ancient paths. It's Memorial Day. It's time for us to avoid being people. We push the memory of folks out of our minds, and they become forgotten. Do not neglect the memory. Do not reject the memory. Do not infect the memory. We need to be people who remember. One of the things I'm convinced enough in this, but one of the things I'm convinced that causes us most of all to fail to appreciate holidays like this weekend is that we rush too fast. We are going so fast from point A to point B and things happen so rapidly within our day that we just simply do not take the time to sit and think and meditate. You know the first step towards a memory that is neglected is a too busy schedule to take time to remember the memory. Memories that are neglected, rejected, and infected will kill our culture and it will also kill your eternity. So this, mem this Memorial Day weekend, take time to remember. This is Sonny Chouse. Thank you for being with me each week. I pray that this has been a blessing. 
be there. Matthew 16, 26.